Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. It's going to be an awesome day. It's going to be an incredible day. Uh, so right after the service, you want to be able, you want to stick around. Okay, it's going to be right after the service, right out those doors over here. And I want you to be careful when you're walking across the courts and stuff. We, we got them taped down, but be careful. Anyway, uh, right after the service, we're going to be uh, we're going to be baptizing Christine Fuller, Sandy Hutchison, Megan Hutchison, Bill Hines, Jan Krug, Valentino Lopez, Desiree Lopez, Abram Lopez, and Fred Sprinkler. Yeah. Woo! I just say praise God for what He's doing in our in our midst, and, and that's just the way that's the way it, it is. So. Anyway, I want to say good morning to everybody who's here, too. Uh, good morning and welcome. Uh, you know, uh, I've already said it once, and I'm going to say welcome to all of those that will be joining us online. And I'm not pointing at you. <laughs> I'm pointing at that camera. Yeah, so, uh, anyway, so if you have your Bibles, and you, and, and, uh, you just turn with me, if you will, and no surprise, we're in John. We're still in John. We're going to be in John for a while, you know. So anyway, we're in John 13, and this morning we're going to pick up where we left off in a part two of last week's message uh, in verse 35. But before we continue on this morning, there is nothing good that happens without prayer. Amen. Nothing good happens without prayer. So let me ask for some help on high. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day, and we thank you for what this day represents. And Lord... Just, oh, there's so much that's going on in, that you're, you're working in each person's life. And what a beautiful thing that is. And so, Lord, I just pray that you you pour your spirit out on this place, that you would open our eyes and ears and hearts to truly hear from you and give us heart that wants to, wants to obey you uh, after we learn what we learn. And so, Lord, uh, there's some great lessons today and, that we can learn from Peter. And so we just ask, Lord, that you would just, you would just be with us this morning. That you would you would help this vessel here uh, that it would be your words and not mine let me step off to the side and let it be your words and not mine and, and lord we just we're going to give you glory for everything that happens today and we pray this in jesus name amen, amen. okay so this morning we continue our, our study in the gospel of john we're coming once again to an important passage of scripture uh, for all believers, for all believers, this passage is absolutely full of truth, it's full of theology, it's full of practical application, because it contains a brand new way to live. Jesus is giving a brand new way to live, and this is really be the beginning of Christ's final words on what it means to be a true disciple, what it means to be his true disciple, and, and this is before the cross. This is the last kind of last statements that he's going through. And we're going to be going through that for quite a bit because John spends quite a bit of time on this last night with the disciples. So this morning we're going to be looking again at the passage that contains Jesus' final words on the night before his death. So we'll see that Jesus gives gives what uh, gives us what, what should be the characteristics of a true disciple. And we started to look at that last week. But the, these are virtues that, are, that characterize all of his disciples. This is what he wants after he leaves. When he is no longer with us, this is what he wants for his disciples. Now, as we started to look at these characteristics last week, we learned that Jesus showed us that a true disciple should be focused on really three things out of this passage. And those three characteristics are what make a true Christian stand out from the crowd. A true disciple of Christ is totally focused, number one, we talked about this last week, on, on God's glory, on God's glory, on, on, the, on the Lord's glory, and love and loyalty to their Lord, those three things. Uh, in other words, a true disciple, you know, an active, visible, easy to spot disciple has a burning desire to first stay focused on Christ's glory, and we looked at that last week. And second, to, to love others totally. That's another thing that he says, you must love others totally. We touched on that also a little bit last week. 
And third is to be loyal to the Lord no matter what. And we're going to be looking at that today. Those are, those are the important characteristics that, are, that belong to a true disciple of Christ. And all of these parts make up that true disciple. And every Christian should have these characteristics. I mean, so when, when you're taking inventory, take inventory today. You should have these characteristics, especially the second one, which is love. That's the second one. And that's the key to everything. So just, just what does a true disciple look like? We asked that last week. What kind of person is a true disciple? Well, let's go. We're going to have to go back to verse 31 and quickly review what we, what we did last week. And it'll help those of you who maybe weren't here. Okay? First off, a true disciple is preoccupied with the Lord's glory. Yeah. So he's preoccupied. He's his head, it's right in, in the top of his head. He's preoccupied with the Lord's glory. To review this characteristic, I, I think if we go back to 31 and 33, I can, I can just review that real quick. But before we once look again at this text, remember, let me remind you that the Lord's glory, God's glory, is the universe's most important theme. You know that you and I were created for his glory. So to live to glorify God is the whole reason that you and I exist. We exist to glorify God in, with our lives, and that's what it's all about. The glory of the Lord is our motive. It's our theme. It is our objective. It's our reason. It's our purpose for life. Everything is for God's glory. Everything. We are to give Him glory, and He deserves it. So giving God glory is a characteristic of the true disciple. Their life reflects God's attributes, and God, God receives glory by the way that we live when we, when we reflect his attributes. Now with that in mind, let's look at verse 31 through 33. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him at once. Little children, uh, yet a little while I am here with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Now you'll recall that we said that Judas had already left. I mean, he's already gone off, and he's already stood, he already put the betrayal in motion. It's already, it's already in motion, and he's now making the final arrangements. So Judas is out of the room. This is the upper room. And there's, so there's 11, 11 disciples left. And in just a few hours, Jesus and his disciples are going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And once there, Jesus is going to go off and he's going to pray. And after he's finished praying, he, Judas and, and, and the soldiers are going to arrive. And the events of the cross will begin. And so it was close. And so Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified. He knows it's close. His glorification is coming. And you recall that we said that Jesus tied his glory to the cross. We said this last week. Uh, when Judas departed, the die was cast. I mean, it was already, it was set in stone. The wheels began to move to make a cross, the cross a reality. And Jesus was ready to die, and he was ready to be glorified. We, we read about that too. So how did the cross bring glory to Christ? Well, first, it brought glory to Christ because on the cross he made it possible for sinners who were going to hell to be able to be saved and go to heaven. He destroyed the power of sin when he died on the cross. And not only that, but Christ's death defeated the devil on the cross. Amen. And then on the cross, Christ paid the price of God's justice and brought all of God's chosen thought, all of God's chosen people to him for himself. And, and so he made it possible for all people who would call on the name of the Lord to be, that could be saved. So God's justice was satisfied with Jesus on the cross, and the, the broken law was fixed, and, and people were set free from, from the bondage of sin. So Jesus' death on the cross is, is the only thing in heaven and earth, if you really look at it, that deserves praise and honor and glory. It's what his work was on the cross. Amen? And, 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 and he made it possible for us. It's just, it's just so, so last week we saw how, how Christ was glorified on the cross, but then we learned that God was glorified in him. Okay, and I'm just going to touch on this because 
if I go just straight to the other, you're just not going it to, it's disjointed. So, how does glory, God's glory shine through Jesus? Well, you'll recall that we said that God's glory is made up of his attributes. All of God's attributes. That's his love, his mercy, his grace, his wisdom, his omniscience, his <coughs> omnipresence, his omnipotence. That's all part of his glory. That's all, that's all his glory. Every attribute of God, all of them are glory. And, and at the cross, every attribute of God, we talked about this, was manifest in, in, in a way that was never before seen before this time. And therefore, God was exalted in Christ's death. And so we looked at many examples of how, how the cross revealed God's attributes and brought glory to God through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. I, I don't need to go through those again because you have them right here, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, so a Christian who's serious about his faith is going to be focused on the glory of the Lord. It's our theme. It's what our message is about. That's what our message is. Our message is good news. That's what the gospel stands for. It is good news. So the true disciple is preoccupied with the Lord's glory, and he sees the death, the burial, the resurrection, the exaltation, and the ascension of Christ, and his return, um, and his return all being the glory of Christ. And, and that is his message, and that is, our, that is our heart cry. Okay, so not only is a true disciple preoccupied with the Lord's glory, but secondly, they're preoccupied with his with his love, with Christ's love. Now, this is a really important word for these disciples. These disciples are really going to need this, this uh, when he gives this word to them. This is an important word for these disciples. A characteristic that will really set them apart from the world. You know, if you love people who are unlovable, I want you to know you're going to stand out. Amen? Yeah. You're going to stand out. Even though they won't be able to see Jesus anymore, these disciples, they are still going to be able to have a rich, full experience of love because he's going to leave them with a storehouse of love in the, in the form of the Holy Spirit's presence in their lives. And so he says here that love shall be their characteristic. Look again at verse 34. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So the second characteristic of true discipleship is their love. It's an unconditional love. This is where we stopped last week. It's, it's a visible characteristic in our lives. People can see this in our lives. And, 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 and the world can see, can see that in your life. And, and that proves that we belong to Jesus when we love those who, who don't deserve our love. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That just starts. This is this group right here. That you love one another. That's the outcome of our love, is that we would show that to the world. Our testimony depends on our love. We must love one another. And how? It says, as the Lord, as the Lord loved you. There's a big... That, that raises the bar a bit, eh? I mean... Jesus said, you love as I have loved you, because Jesus is the example. He's the only example. Now, the Greek word here, you probably all know it, yeah, okay, it's agape, agapeo, right? That's the Greek. It, it's not a feeling love, it, 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 it's a love of the will. It's, 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 it's not warm feelings that you have for someone. That's, that's eros love. Or another kind of love, or phileo kind of love for that would be brotherly love for 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 someone. Uh, this is agape. This is an unconditional love, yeah, and and it's it's a love that says I choose to love that person whether they deserve it or not. I'm choosing to love them. Agape love is an unconditional kind of love, and so Jesus says I want you to love, but not love without a qualifier. I'm going to give you a qualifier. I want you to love just like I have loved you. Just like I've loved you. What kind of love is this? It's a love that loves the unlovely. Do you know there are unlovely people? <laughs> there are people that are hard to love, right? You know? 
It's, it's a sacrificial love. It's a costly love. It's an indiscriminate love. You don't, you don't pick and choose who you're going to love. Uh, it is pure. It's a pure love. It is a divine love. Divine. And that's the way that we're supposed to love. We're to love each other. In 1 John 3.11, John repeated this idea, and he says, For this is the message that you, you have heard from the beginning, that, you, that we should love one another. And then Paul, he kind of adds to that mix when he says in Galatians 6 and verse 10, he says, So then, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially those who are in the household of faith. But you notice he added everyone. Right? Okay. So we're not just the people in the household of faith. So the scope of our love, the scope, it extends beyond us. Amen? I mean, it does. It extends. We're not just to love each other. That's just where we begin. If we, if we can't love one another, how are you going to love people that aren't lovable? Right? So you got to love the brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and, and it won't be until we have a healthy love for each other that we can really begin to love other people as well. Uh, I, that makes sense. And Peter's words confirm that truth in 1 Peter 4, 8, as he says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. And we got plenty of sins that need covering, don't we? Yeah. So our characteristic is to be love. We are to love, and our testimony is to be a testimony of unconditional love. And if you have a hard time loving people, and sometimes I do, I mean, you know you say, no, Mike, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, sometimes I have trouble. Just remember, you have a brand new capacity, God-given capacity. It's not your capacity, it's God-given to love. Romans 5.5 5 says, Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. If you belong to Christ, you have the Holy Spirit residing in your life. And His love is an infinite love. And you know what? The only way you stop that is when you put a cork in it and you stifle it. You can't. So he wants, to, he wants to use you. So you see, you can't measure that kind of love. That kind of love that Jesus is talking about, you can't measure it because His love is immeasurable. It's, it's as far as the east is from the west. It's as far as the heights are from the depths of the sea. I mean, it's, it, it's it, all of that. That love is just is, is amazing. So Jesus is our example. And He says, love as I've loved you. That means this love is to be selfless, is to be sacrificial, is to be indiscriminate, understanding, forgiving love, just like Christ's love. And love like this is impossible to achieve on your own. I want you to know it. You, you can muster up all the desire in the world, but you're never going to do it on your own. You must allow God's love to enter your life first before you you'd ever be able to share this kind of love with someone else. So we have our example of love, and that's Jesus himself, and we've seen the scope of our love, and that's to all people, especially to our own brothers and sisters in Christ. And then we see the outcome of our love. The world will know that we belong to him. So we've been, we've been commissioned, per se, to love. That's, what, that's our new commission. And our testimony is a testimony of unconditional love. That's the way people will know there's something different about your life, right? That's how they're going to know. Okay, we come to the third characteristic in verse 36. Uh, a true disciple is loyal to the Lord. And here in these verses, we're going to see that third characteristic with truth. It, it's, 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 a, it's a characteristic of faithfulness and loyalty to the Lord. And this is illustrated in a very short conversation that Peter and Jesus have. It's a very short conversation. Now, this is fantastic. It is a profound insight. Okay, I mean, just get ready for it. Okay, it's profound. And I believe that God is going to show us some principles here that, are, that can really transform our lives if we allow them to transform our lives. You see, discipleship is more than a promise to be faithful. It's more than just making a promise to God, which we do so often and so, so many times without thought. Discipleship requires a kind of loyalty that is practiced, a kind of loyalty that works. And, and, and if you're like me, You've made tons of promises to God over the years. Amen? Amen? I've made tons of promises to God throughout my life, and I've told Him many times uh, that I was going to keep them. 
And you know, I say, God, I'm going to do this, and, I, and I'm going to do this and this and this, and I'm going to do it from now on. And I'm going to share the gospel with so-and-so. I'm going to reach out to my neighbor or my friend or my family member. I'm going to, I'm going to go pray more. I'm going to, Lord, I'm going to be in the Bible more. I've told God all of that. And as a Christian, we make promises of loyalty repeatedly, don't we? Don't we? And here in this passage, we're going to see that a true disciple just doesn't say they're going to be loyal. They are loyal. They are loyal. And they keep their word. Now, let me give you one more thought before we get to verse 36. I want you to know in this, in this passage, Peter is pretty upset right now. He's really kind of ticked. He, does, he doesn't, you know, you get mad when you can't change something, right? You just, you just can't. You can't, you, you know, it, it, <laughs> it, it's just, he's, he's mad. He's mad. He's upset that Jesus was going to leave. All this talk about Jesus leaving, it bothered Peter a lot. And, you know, Peter wasn't one of those quiet guys, you know. Yeah, as a matter of fact, if Peter was in this room, he'd be, he'd be back there going, yeah, yeah that's me, yeah. And, and as he said in verse 33, he said, I'll, I'm only, Jesus said, I'm only going to be here for a short time. You're going to try and find me, and you're not going to be able to, and you won't be able to come where I'm coming. I'm leaving. I'm, 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 I'm going back to glory, right? And Peter couldn't stand thinking about Jesus leaving, and he hated thinking about it. In Matthew 16, we're introduced to the problem, okay? There was a root problem that he had, and, and we're introduced to it in Matthew 16. Jesus said in, in, in Matthew 16, says, from the time that Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. So he's already told the disciples, right? And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, that'll never happen. That'll never happen to you. Can I say that's pretty bold? <laughs> that's pretty bold. He's rebuking the Son of God, saying, Far be it from you, that'll never happen to you. In essence, he's saying, Never, no, never. That will never happen to you. And, but, but he turned and said to Peter, this is Jesus, he turned and said to Peter, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. That's the, that's the King James, isn't that coming out? Yeah. You're a hindrance to me, he says, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but the things of man. And the devil tried to use Peter. I want you to know, the devil tried to use Peter, and he'll continue to try to use people to keep you from, from the task that he's got at hand. But he tried to keep Christ from the cross at this point. So here you have Peter who doesn't want Jesus to be taken away under any condition. And that really revealed kind of an odd thing in Peter's life, a little odd attitude in his heart. You see, Peter didn't want to lose Jesus. He didn't want to lose him. So in verse 36, Peter speaks with, speaks with this in mind. He says, he says, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. So Peter's saying, Lord, where are you going? Where are you going? He's asking because, you know what? You know what's implied by him asking? It's like, I'm going with you. That's what's implied. It's like, are you going to the grocery store? I'm going with you, right? You know? So Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot, can, so, so where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. And he did, and tradition of the church actually says that he was crucified upside down. He was, uh, and it wasn't too long after, it was around AD 67 or 68. Uh, but Peter had this thing, he really wanted to be with Jesus, always wanted to be with Jesus. And it really bothered him because he didn't want to lose Jesus. He wanted to go with Jesus. And in fact, the, the, the fact that he couldn't go with Jesus, that really bothered him. So he was ready to go, and his love, his love is admirable. Don't you think? I think his love is admirable, but I think his assertiveness with the Lord is ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous. Now, going back to verse 36, we see that he's hesitant to, uh, to accept Christ's response. What did he say? Right? He said that he's going away. And, and in verse 37, he boasts on how courageous he is. Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. Oh, boy, 
boy. Foot and mouth disease, right? Now he realizes that Jesus has been talking about dying all this time. You know he's, he's aware that he's talking about dying. I mean, he, he, Jesus has just said things like, truly, truly, unless a grain of, of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He's talking about himself going into the grave. And, 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 and we just read where he has spoken about his death in Matthew 16. And Peter knows this. But that doesn't stop Peter from just blurting this out. Now watch this one. He says, I'm going to lay my life down for you. Lord, if you're going to die, I'm happy to die with you. I want to die with you. I want to go. I'm ready to die for you right now. Oh boy, is this guy impulsive. <laughs> I mean, anytime I study, I study about Peter, I just go, wow, he is so impulsive. He's, you know, you know actually he's bragging, you know, he's bragging. I'm sure he said this for the benefit of the disciples that were around him at the time. And what's worse, he says, I know more than you. You think I ought to stay, but I say I should go. I want to go with you. And yet, he loves Jesus so much, and you can't deny his love. You see, he loved, but he didn't have the Spirit's direction because he was working out of the flesh. You know, he was just working out of the flesh. So Jesus says to him in verse 38, Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Don't you love how Jesus, when you give him a question, or when you give a statement, he confirms that statement with you, you know? It's kind of like later on, we're going to find that, where Peter is, is there and he says, uh, do you love me, Peter? Yeah, we'll, we'll get into that when we get into that, you know. Jesus is saying, will you really do that for me, Peter? Will you die for me? Really die for me, Peter? Listen. He says then, truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you've denied me three times. Now, we all know the story. Can you imagine what was going through Peter's mind? Do you ever put yourself in the page like that? I do. I, I, I go, whoa, what a statement. You know, uh, and you know, you, if you realize, Peter is so shocked by what Jesus just told him that he doesn't say anything else except to repeat that boast a little bit later on. Uh, and, and, and you can see that in Mark 14. Let's look at that. They head out to Gethsemane, to the Garden of Gethsemane, and this has been on Peter's mind, and he's willing to die for the Lord. So look at, look at Mark 14. It's in your outline. <clears throat> and, when, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all fall away. You will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will, will, be, gat, will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you in Galilee. And he did. Now watch this. Peter said to him, even though they will all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Now watch what Peter says. It says, but he said emphatically, emphatically. I mean, that's with serious emphasis, right? We're talking... Uh, you know, it's from the heart, right? Uh, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And he said it so passionately that the other, all the other disciples joined in. They all chimed in. All, and the Bible says, and they all said the same. All of us are willing to die with you. Isn't that amazing? It just, it just amazes me. Now you drop down to verse 43 and let's see what happened. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came, and one of the, that's one of the twelve, with a, with, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. So they came and they got Jesus. Now look at verse 50, and let's see what these brave disciples did. Verse 50 says, the disciples were arrested with Jesus. Is that what it says? No. Does it say, then all the disciples defended Jesus? No, it says, it says this, and they all left him and fled. They all left him. We're out of here. Now, you can see there was a pretty big difference between what they said they would do and what they did. Amen? And, and good old impetuous Peter, he brags boldly about it. I'll never deny you. I would die first. So what did he do? Anything but that. He did everything but that. 
that there's a huge difference between what Peter said and what he did. Instead of giving his life for Jesus, he will try to save his life by deserting him and denying him. So he doesn't, and he doesn't deny him quietly, if you've read the passage. He does it loudly in front of many people in three different occasions. And one of them, he starts adding some very colorful words to it, too. He starts cursing. And so Jesus says, you'll deny me. And this, and this is interesting because he, look, at, look in verse 36. The rooster will not crow till you've denied me three times. That meant that it was going to happen at a certain time. There's a certain time when the rooster crows, right? And, and in the mind of a Jew, there was four, four periods of a night. Okay, there's four periods of a night. Evening was from 6 to 9 p.m. And we used to call these, in, 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 for Mariner's terms, it would be watches of the night. Okay, so, but in this case, evening was from 6 to 9 p.m. Then there was midnight, which was from the time from the, from, uh, from the time of 9 to 12 p.m. or midnight. And, and then there was the uh, time that was called the rooster crowing. And, and that was the time from midnight to 3. The next part of the morning, which was lasted from 3 to 6, was called morning. I mean, just morning. So he says, you will deny me before the rooster crows. That means that between midnight and 3 o'clock in the morning, that, uh, that's going to happen. And good old Peter would hear the rooster crow at 3 and, and, and he would begin to weep. And the words of Jesus, they were fulfilled. To Peter, the unthinkable and what was unbelievable in his mind was going to come to pass because Jesus said it was going to come to pass. Peter was so upset by these prophecies that he didn't say anything during the conversation. I just told you that. And, 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 and that's not like Peter because Peter is always talking. He's ta he sometimes tends to talk too much. Now let me say this about Peter, though, in his defense. Because when you read the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll notice that Peter plays a big role in everything. Peter talks more than anyone else in that group. He talks more than anyone else. Peter is addressed more than any of the other disciples by Christ. Jesus rebukes Peter more than any of the other apostles. And Peter is always on the first, first place in the list of 12 apostles and there's four lists of them, four lists of them in, in, the, in the Gospels. So he is impetuous, he's impulsive, he's brash, he's bold, he's hot-tempered. He is competitive, and he is really, really rough around the edges. Uh, you know, add to that that he thinks very highly of himself. And he brags a lot, and you've got a time bomb ready to, blow, ready to blow. I mean, it's ready to go off. You know, he's always talking. But right now, after all this has been said, he's not saying anything. He must have been thinking about this. He was, that he was failing the loyalty test. And I want to show you four reasons why I think that he failed that, the loyalty test. And I know, I want you to know that you can use these four reasons to see if you pass or you fail in the loyalty test for yourself, okay? Look at, uh, now I'm, gonna, I'm kind of all over the place, but in Luke 22 in your Bible, and I put it all in your outline, which is another parallel passage. I'm gonna explain how this all comes together. Um, he failed the loyalty test because of four things. When he, when he said it, it was fine. It was fine for him to make that boast. To be, to be bragging like that, it was fine. But the problem was, is he just couldn't do it. He couldn't come through with what he was promising. You see, there are four things that, that Peter did that got him into trouble. First, he bragged way too much. He bragged way too much. Secondly, he prayed too little. He, did, he, didn't, have, he didn't spend much time in prayer. Third, he was impetuous and he acted too quickly. And you, I mean, all the time, you see him acting too quickly. And fourth, he didn't stay close to Jesus. So he boasted too much, he prayed too little, he acted too quickly, and he didn't stay close to Jesus. And the consequences are disastrous. Disastrous. First off, I want you to see that Peter boasted too much. Look at verse 31 of, of Luke 22. We'll start right there. <clears throat> Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you, 
that he might sift you like wheat. You know, when, when wheat was sifted, when you would see it, sift wheat, it was done so that the real grain would stay and, and it could be separated from the chaff, the false, false wheat. And Satan wants to test Peter to see if, if he really is who he says he is. Peter claims a lot, but Satan wants to see if he, put it, he wants to put him to the test. Satan, as you know, is the accuser of the brethren. And he loves to, the, uh, to accuse you and me, any believer, before God. So the Lord knew what Satan would do uh, and gave him permission to do it. It's a great test for Peter. And so Peter's big test began. Verse 32, it says, But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. You know, that just tells you a lot in just one sentence. Uh, so Jesus tells Peter that, that, that Peter would deny him and that Satan's going to test him. And then Jesus knew that Peter was going to fail the test, but he also knew that Peter would get back up and he'd brush himself off. And he'd learn from his mistake and help his fellow disciples. Jesus said, when you return to me, strengthen your brothers. Don't you love that? I just love that. In other words, I know you're going to fail. I know you're going to fail, but when you get back up, when I help you get back up and you get back up, yeah, you're going to strengthen your brothers. That, and we go through troubles like that, trials like that sometimes. And the reason we do is so we can strengthen someone else. Okay? But again, in verse 33, Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. There it is again. What's Peter's problem? Right? He bragged about himself too much. It's easy to brag. Amen? God, I promise to do this. And, and you know, he's always bragging. Always bragging. Peter, Peter should have just kept his mouth shut and made his claim later. You know, you keep your mouth shut and then you go, I, I, I would have died for you. I would have, you know. If you don't do anything to brag about, I mean, I mean if, if you don't have anything to brag about, it's dangerous to brag about if you don't have anything to brag about. It's a very dangerous thing to brag about yourself, but that's what Peter was doing. He's boasting in the flesh. In the flesh. Now, it is true in a sense that a Christian does have a right to boast. we got a lot to boast about. There's a lot that we can boast about. There are legitimate boasts. And the Apostle Paul, he tells us all sorts of things that we can boast about. So what, what did he boast in? Well, there's a whole section of 2 Corinthians that tells us what he was boasting in. And it's kind of fun to read 2 Corinthians, and there's all these areas. And just mark down all the boasts that he makes, you know. He, he, let me show you. First, he was boasting in others. That was in chapter 7. He boasts in what God is doing in other people's lives. Then he boasts then in chapters 8 and 9, he boasted about the love of others for, the, for others. I mean, so he's boasting about that. Chapter 11, he boasted about the faith and the, and the generosity of the believers there. Boasting in others is a good thing. It really is. I'm, I'm proud of Harvest Church. I'm proud of you. And I boast about you all the time because of the good things that you do. There's another thing that Paul boasted in. He boasted in his call to ministry. And that's a beautiful thing when God calls you to ministry. Verse 13 of chapter 10 uh, that's where that is. And then in, in his greatest boast is found in verse 17, and it should be all of ours. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. In the Lord. You know, uh, so he boasted in Christ. And Peter's problem was that he was boasting in himself, right? And that's disastrous when you're boasting about yourself. Okay, second problem Peter had, Luke 22, he prayed too little. He prayed too little. He boasted too much and he prayed way too little. Verse 39 of, of Luke 22. And he came out and went, as, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now look at verse 45. And when he rose from prayer, this, he spent his time praying. When he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples, and what did he find them? He found them sleeping for sorrow and he said to them why are you sleeping rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation you know why peter fell into temptation and denied his lord you know why because he went to sleep instead of praying 
Jesus told them to watch and pray. Uh, prayer keeps you from giving in to temptation. Do you know that? Uh, if Satan tempts you all the time and you don't know why, it's probably because you don't pray. Amen. That's just the truth. Pray so you don't fall into temptation. Peter learned this lesson because over in 1 Peter 4, 7, I love this. You like, you like to know, did he learn the lesson? Did he really learn the lesson? When he gives instruction to new Christians, he's saying, he's thinking, you know, the end of the, all things is at hand. And therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. <laughs> you think he got the lesson? Yeah. Amen, Peter, right? Now, uh, here he's talking from his own experience, his own life. He didn't pick up a book and say, I, mean, I read this in a book. He's talking about, and being watchful means to stay awake. It means to be alert and pray. So he boasted too much and he prayed too little. Third, Peter was impetuous, okay? How many times have I told you he's impetuous? He's very impetuous. He acts way too quickly. He was quick to act. And now... And, and that's sometimes how we are, isn't it? Isn't it the way we are? We say, okay, God, here I am. God, I'm, I'm running out to do that job for you right now. Right now, I'm going to go do it. I know that you want me to do it. I think I, I, think I know you want me to do it. And we, we really don't know what we're doing, and, or even if God wants us there or not, because we really didn't go to him and ask him all that much. We're just jumping out there on, on our own, kind of like Peter. Peter was impulsive, in, in, impulsive, and he was impetuous. Verse 50 of Luke 20, you'll remember, and when they all come to get Jesus in the garden, Peter's, Peter's going to get, get, he's going to react. He's going to react badly, and he's going to react quickly. He's, he's ready to go to battle, okay? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Now Luke is just being nice when he says one of them. You know, it's Peter. And that's Peter, just winging and swinging the sword, you know. And, and But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and he healed him. What Jesus said, and, and this is really interesting, he said, no more of this. No more of this. Now he's saying that to Peter and to the man who was doubtless car carrying on and crying in pain, you know, because his ear just got whopped off. So Jesus excused himself and went to work and he touched his ear and he healed him. Good old impetuous Peter, he's out there with his, with his little sword. I imagine it's probably rusty because a fisherman, what does a fisherman do with a sword, right? And Jesus says, pardon my friend, he's just being pretty impetuous. He's, he's, he reacts too fast. I wonder how many times that Jesus had to say that in defense of you or me. You know, sorry, Mike doesn't know what he's doing, right? Pastor Mike doesn't know what he, he can be kind of a loose cannon at times, right? It's so easy to do sometimes, amen? You know, you just you just grit your teeth and you run around and you chop ears off. I, I, I almost did that last night. I was just running around chopping ears off. Here I go, I'm going to defend you, Lord, you know. And the Lord says, that's not the idea. That's not the idea. Peter thought that he was helping but what he was doing was the exact opposite. Matthew's account comes up, this comes into mind at this point, and it gives us a little more detail, okay? In, in verse 52 and 53 of Matthew 26, Jesus said to him, put your sword back into, it, into, into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? He says, Peter, really, I don't need your sword. That's not the way it's done. So he, he, <laughs> he boasted too much. He prayed too little. He acted too quickly. And the fourth thing that he did is he, did, he, he neglected to stay close to Jesus. He didn't stay close to Jesus. And this, is <clears throat> this was really the greatest disaster of all of the mistakes that he made. This is the worst. Luke twenty two fifty four. 54. Then they seized him and led him away. They took Jesus. Okay, that's what that's saying. Bringing him to the high priest's house. Now watch this. And, and Peter was what? Following at a distance. At a distance. For the first time in three years, we don't find Peter on Jesus' heels. 
We don't find him standing right next to Jesus or running in front of Jesus trying to get in front of him. For the first time in three years, Peter willfully chose to follow Jesus at a distance, and that was a huge mistake. Obviously, he was afraid of what was going to happen to him. And for the first time, Peter drifted from being close to Christ. And you know what, what the effect was? Look at verse 55. And when they kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Not only did he distance himself from Jesus, but now he's joined the crowd around a comfortable campfire, and he's quickly shifted his identity. And he's no longer the follower of Jesus, he's just one of the crowd who's waiting to see what's going to happen. But, but then a servant girl, God will let you get away with that, by the way. But then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man was also with him, but he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little, uh, and a little later, someone else saw him and said, You're also one of them. But Peter said, Man, I'm not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, Certainly this man was also with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was speaking, still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord and how he had said to him, before the rooster, rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. What a huge mistake. Even though he can see his Lord, his Lord is in eyesight. He denies him three times. And when the rooster crowed, Jesus turned and he looked at Peter. And Peter remembered and bless his heart, he went out and wept his heart out. And I would too. How many times have we done that to Jesus? Listen, it's important to stay close to Jesus. It's important. Uh, Peter blew it when he didn't stay close to Jesus. He boasted too much, he prayed too little, he acted quickly, and he didn't stay close. And the, and the disastrous result is obvious. So let me ask you, what about your loyalty? What about your loyalty to the Lord? How about it? How, how much have you told Jesus you would do? Did you tell him that you'd love him uh, unconditionally? Did you tell him that you'd be his servant? Did you tell him that you'd be faithful and that you'd never deny him or, or never leave him? Did you tell him that you, that you would live or die for him? Or, or that you would be a, a witness for him to your neighbor or your friend or your family member? Did, what kind of promises have you made to the Lord? How do, how do you pass the loyalty test? Did you make too many claims? Do you pray too little? Do you act too quickly? Or not, or, or maybe not stay close to Jesus? I, I think of it myself. How many promises have you made to God that you've never kept? Listen, I've done the same thing, so I know exactly what I'm talking about. And I, I, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you I haven't. I imagine that every Christian who has ever lived has denied Jesus in the same way that Peter has in this passage. All of us have done it, and it's tragic when we do. And when I look back on my life, I see all the things that I promised God, but somehow didn't manage to keep. And I pray that all of us, for all of us, that God will help us to be loyal, and that, the, that our words to the Lord will mean something because our actions will match them. You know, Peter did finally pass that test. He passed the test. He finally got up on the day of Pentecost. He preached a, a wonderful message. 3,000 were saved on the first day. He suffered and he died for his Lord, Jesus Christ, because he, because he was loyal to the Lord. The beginning of the story is kind of sad, you know, with this denial. But if you read the rest of the book of Acts, you're going to see that Peter was a real powerhouse. And Christ turned his life completely around. And listen, you can turn things around in your life right now, today. Maybe you haven't been honest or maybe you haven't been loyal with Jesus, loyal to Jesus. You can change that today. You know how you do it? It's simple. John tells us if you confess with your, uh, if you confess your sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's that simple. All you have to do is confess it. Confessing is agreeing with God that that's the way it is. And Peter, and Peter, and like Peter, we can be, this, this day, it can be a turning point in your life. From right now on, you may boast a little bit less, you may pray a little bit more, you can act a little bit slower, and follow a lot closer. And that's what we want to do. So I hope you'll make that your goal. That, that way you're going to know you're going to get good results. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this scripture. I thank you that it's just jam-packed with application for our lives. We thank you for everything that we've learned from Peter's life. It's, it's a hard thing to be looking at someone's life and, and, and just know that that, that, that that could be the same as our life. But, but Lord, we pray that these simple truths will find a home in our hearts today for Christ's glory and, and help us to apply what we've learned today into our lives so that we too won't make those mistakes that Peter made and that we would continue our walk with you. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here today that doesn't know you in a real and personal way, that they'll take this time during the invitation, that they'll inquire about it in the back as we give this invitation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you know I always give an invitation.